Okay, I've started the recording. Um, yeah, uh, I think we can give it maybe a minute or two more, and then uh, and then I guess we can get started. Um, yeah, I've also got the chat uh, window as part of the recording. Uh, so if you just go to the voice, so if anyone has something they want to write out, um, feel free to put that in. Uh, I don't know if we should do, Steve, do you want to do kind of questions throughout the talk or uh, should we wait till uh, the end of the talk before we uh, ask questions? Uh, let's do throughout, um, but mm -hmm. I reserve the right to put people off um, if uh, something seems tangential or something. Awesome. All right, cool. Let's go with that then. I got the chat up too. All right, perfect. All right, should we get started then? Me. Me. Oh, sorry, what was that? Uh, sure. All right. Um, Okay, I'll, I'll just jump in then. Let's go. All right, uh, thanks everybody for coming. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, so this is gonna be, oops, um, based on blog posts called Intro to Brain Like AGI Safety. If you've read all of them, you'll find this kind of redundant, um, but you're still welcome to stay. Um, my name is uh, Steve Burns. And uh, I live in the Boston area, um, I, but I'm sort of a, employed remotely by Estera Institute, uh, which is based in Berkeley. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about challenges for safe and beneficial brain-like artificial general intelligence um, for the next 35 minutes. Um, uh, as came up before, feel free to jump in with questions. Um, yeah, <laughs> don't worry, I'm funded by an entirely different crypto billionaire. That joke was very fresh when I wrote it three months ago. <laughs> um, I needed I need a new one now. Um, okay, so I'll tar start with. Well, we don't have to talk about the outline. You'll see as we go. Um, so start with sort of general motivation. Um, the big question that I'm working on. Um, again, I'm sort of assuming that the audience has a range of backgrounds, and uh, some of you will find parts of this redundant. So, but whatever. Um, so the big question that I'm working on is what happens when people figure out how to run brain-like algorithms on computer chips? Uh, I guess I should say if and when, but we can get back to that. Um, and uh, I find that when I bring this up to people, they um, uh, they tend to have two sorts of reactions. Um, one is that we should think of uh, these future algorithms as uh, like tools um, for people to use. Um, and the other is that we should think of them as like a new intelligent species on the planet. So let's go through those one by one. Uh, so this is kind of the perspective that would be more familiar to AI people. If we put brain-like algorithms on computer chips, then that would be a form of artificial intelligence. And everybody knows that uh, AI today is a tool for people to use. Um, so on this perspective, the subproblem I'm working on is accident prevention. So we want to avoid the scenarios where uh, the AI does something that nobody wanted it to do, not the people who programmed it, not anybody. Um, so um, there uh, is a technical problem to solve there, uh, which is that uh, if people figure out how to run brain-like algorithms on computer chips and they want those algorithms to be trying to do X, where X is solar cell research or being honest or you know whatever you can think of being helpful, um, then what source code should they write? What training environment should they use? And so on. So this is an unsolved problem. Uh, it turns out to be surprisingly tricky for some pretty deep reasons that mostly are not going to be in the scope of this talk, but you can read the series. Um, so here's the sort of um, bigger picture of, of, of that. So if we want mm -hmm. our awesome post-AGI future, then we want uh, to avoid, you know, catastrophic accidents where the AI gets out of control and self-replicates around the internet and kills everybody. Uh, and then um, 
And that's that's one helpful ingredient. Mm -hmm. The other one is that we want to avoid, you know, war and inequality and bad actors and, and all those other things, coordination problems. Um, so within the avoid catastrophic accidents category, we want there to be some instruction manual or procedure that you can follow where you get the, the AGI that doesn't kill everybody. Uh, and then you also need everybody to actually follow that manual. So I'm not going to talk about these blue boxes and I don't generally work on them much. Um, I'm going to talk about this, this red part. Um, so, uh, that's the first perspective where AI is a tool for people to use. Uh, the other perspective is that um, if we put brain-like algorithms on computer chips, then uh, we should think of this as a new intelligent species that we're inviting onto our planet. Uh, not just that, but a new intelligent species, which uh, will in, most, in all likelihood eventually vastly outnumber humans and think much faster than humans and be more insightful and creative and competent, and, and they'll be building on each other's knowledge and uh, you know, solving problems by inventing tools and... Um, you know, anything that, uh, you know, making plans and pivoting when the plans fail and uh, all the things that, that humans and groups of humans and societies of humans can do, uh, presumably these algorithms uh, and our groups of these algorithms uh, can do too. So um, if we are uh, inviting this intelligent species onto our planet, then how do we make sure it's a species that we actually want to share the planet with? Uh, and how do we make sure that they want to share the planet with us? Uh, and again, there's this, this technical problem that whatever properties we want the species to have, we need to write the source code or come up with training environments or whatever it is to make sure that that actually happens. Um, and I think that uh, high functioning sociopaths are an illustrative example here. They do exist and that suggests that it's at least possible to put brain like algorithms on computer chips that lack any inherent uh, motivation to compassion and friendship. Um, and I would go further and say that not only is it possible, but it's strictly easier to do that. I think that compassion and friendship uh, have to be added into the source code. Um, and I think that we don't currently know how to do that. Uh, so I think we should try to figure it out. Um, OK, so what about other paths to AGI? Um, so we don't have to make AGI by putting brain-like algorithms on computer chips, at least not in principle. Uh, if uh, AGI winds up in the general category of model-based reinforcement learning, uh, then I, I claim that, that the stuff that I work on in general and the stuff in this talk will probably be control type problems and alignment problems for that kind of artificial general intelligence. Uh, I'll get back to model-based RL later in the talk. Uh, if it's not in the general category of model-based RL, then maybe what I'm talking about won't be so useful. Um, so then I have this polite diplomatic cop-out claim that says we should be contingency planning for any plausible path to AGI, uh, or um, I guess you could call it a threat model if you're more of a doomer like me. Um, what I actually believe but won't uh, argue for in this talk is that we're very likely to wind up with quote-unquote brain-like AGI uh, for better or worse, um, which makes this an even better idea to be thinking about. Um, okay, so moving on from general motivation, uh, I next want to talk about a very big picture of brain algorithms um, in terms of these two, two things that I made up called learning subsystem and steering subsystem. Uh, so as we start diving into brains, uh, the first uh, thing that I want to say is that we do actually already know enough about brain algorithms to say useful things about a hypothetical brain-like AGI. Uh, so I do get some pushback uh, already at this point where people, you know, joke about how complicated the brain is. I joke about how complicated the brain is, too. The brain is very complicated. Um, uh, nevertheless, uh, I claim that understanding the brain well enough for future researchers to make brain-like AGI uh, is different from and much simpler than understanding the brain full stop. Um, and uh, there's a few reasons for that. Uh, first is that learning algorithms are much simpler than trained models. Um, so probably a bunch of people here at Luther AI know how to make a convolutional neural net, um, but basically nobody could look at the 100 million parameters of a trained image classifier and explain in full detail how it can tell apart different breeds of dog. Uh, so by the same token, uh, if you look at the 
uh, neuroscience and cognitive science literature, especially cognitive science, um, there's a lot of discussions about how an adult human does some intelligent thing. And I claim that that's at least a question about trained models and not entirely a question about learning algorithms. So uh, I claim that people will be building brain-like AGI long before they know the answer to lots of questions in like that in cognitive science. Uh, the second issue is that uh, algorithms tend to be much simpler than their physical instantiations. Uh, so again, uh, here at Luther AI, uh, everybody would be laughed out of town if they didn't know how to program a convolutional neural net. And um, yeah, at, uh, uh, almost nobody here probably understands everything that goes into uh, the physical implementation of that convolutional neural net on atoms. So that includes everything from, you know, uh, you know, shock key junctions to, to uh, you know, metal con all of the complexity that goes into this uh, physical object, the brain. Uh, and then last but not least, and somewhat relatedly, not everything in the brain is required for brain-like AGI. So for example, you can find generally intelligent people, like they can you know, make plans and pivot when the plan fail, all the things that I was talking about, uh, live independently, uh, but they're lacking maybe an entire cortical hemisphere, or they're missing a cerebellum, or you know, they don't have a sense of smell. Um, the, uh, as a particular example, somewhere in your medulla, I think, is um, some brain circuitry that says like, okay, you know, this is a good time to vomit. And when you vomit, like you contract the following 17 muscles in the following order, blah, 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 you know, release these hormones. And nobody is going to be reverse engineering how that works before we have brain-like AGI. Okay, so... Um, that's sort of my motivational speech that we shouldn't be put off from uh, studying the brain because the brain is so complicated. Um, so now that we're uh, gonna dive into the brain a little bit, um, a key term or concept that I find very useful and that's really central to how I think about the brain is learning from scratch. Uh, so I'll give two examples of learning from scratch and then I'll say what they have in common. So the first example is any machine learning algorithm that's initialized from random weights. And the second example is a blank flash drive. You just bought it from the store and the bits are all random or they're all zeros or whatever. Um, so what do these have in common? Um, you, they initially can only emit signals that are random garbage, uh, but over time they can emit more and more useful signals um, thanks to uh, some learning algorithm or other algorithm that uh, updates uh, internal memory store within this module. So in the blank flash drive, you can't get any information off of a blank flash drive until you've already written information onto it. Um, and in the case of a machine learning algorithm, you know, your randomly initialized ConvNet is going to output total garbage when you first turn it on, but then gradient descent makes it more and more useful. Um, so by the same token, we can look at the brain and say, what if uh, at least we can entertain the hypothesis that some part of the brain uh, is learning from scratch in that sense. So the it's built by the genome, and when it's built by the genome, it is not able to do anything biologically useful for the organism. It um, emits random outputs, and it's not helping the organism survive and thrive and reproduce. Uh, but um, the organ, or this module or whatever piece of the brain, um, gradually learns and changes over the course of a lifetime. And by the time the organism is an adult, uh, by the time the animal is an adult, it, um, it's very useful. Uh, so memory systems are obvious examples. Uh, it's not, you know, having memory or having the ability to form new memories does not help until you have already, it doesn't help you in the moment. Uh, it only helps you once you've already formed memories, just like that blank flash drive. 
Uh, so my hypothesis is that uh, a whopping 96% of the human brain by volume uh, learns from scratch in this sense. Um, that includes the whole uh, cortical mantle, uh, neocortex, the hippocampus, um, the amygdala, uh, the thalamus I'm sort of lumping in here. Um, you, it doesn't matter if you don't know what these terms mean. Um, the whole striatum um, and uh, the cerebellum too, plus other bits and pieces. Uh, the major exceptions, I think, are the hypothalamus and brainstem. Um, I think that those uh, absolutely do not learn from scratch. I think that they're doing very useful things for an animal uh, uh, in a sort of right from the way that they're formed and how they're formed. Um, so uh, should we believe my hypothesis that all these different parts of the brain are learning from scratch? Um, so my take is that there's lots of strong evidence. I have a blog post uh, going through some of the um, some of what what goes into that. Uh, I find that a few neuroscientists uh, agree with me and a few disagree. Uh, it seems that a great many have never considered the hypothesis in the first place. Uh, for example, there's a semi-famous uh, review post about the role of learning algorithms in the brain, and it says, you know, maybe we should. You know, some people think that, you know, the brain has learning algorithms, but, you know, newborns are able to do all these neat things. Um, and therefore, maybe we should think of it as pre-trained learning algorithms or something. Um, and he doesn't even entertain the hypothesis that maybe there are pure learning algorithms in some parts of the brain. And there are things that are not learning algorithms in other parts of the brain, um, which I see as a very viable hypothesis. And in particular, uh, there's some evidence that newborn behavior is significantly driven by the brainstem. OK, so if you buy this picture, um, and we can argue about it in the questions, um, if you buy this picture, then you wind up thinking of the brain as two subsystems, a learning subsystem and a steering subsystem. And I'll get back to why I'm calling it steering in a little bit. So the learning subsystem has all these trained models in it, which are horrifically complicated by the time you're an adult. And they're you know built by learning algorithms. Um, so uh, I should clarify a few things that this picture is not because because um, uh, I get this this a lot. So the first thing that this is not is uh, old brain versus new brain or triune brain. Um, so uh, that's like Jeff Hawkins uh, talks about old brain and new brain. Uh, Paul Paul McLean and others have talked about triune brain. Um, these are kind of discredited theories for various reasons. Um, so one problem is that uh, they have, uh, I think the boundaries, I draw the boundaries differently than they do. Uh, in particular, I think the, um, for example, I think that the amygdala and the hypothalamus are very, very different. The amygdala is a learning algorithm and the hypothalamus is not, uh, but the triune brain theory puts them together. Um, and also both subsystems are extremely old, I think predating vertebrates. And even if you look at uh, fruit fly nervous systems, um, I believe there's good evidence that you can uh, divide it into a learning subsystem and a steering subsystem. Of course, um, our learning subsystems are a whole lot more complicated than they were 650 million years ago. And likewise, our steering subsystems are more complicated, um, but they're both old. Uh, another thing that this is not is blank slate or nurture rather than nature. Uh, for one thing, I have this whole part of the brain that can can be, and I think is, just chock full of very specific, uh, species-specific instincts. Um, and another thing is that, uh, obviously, to probably most of you guys, uh, learning algorithms can have, can and do have internal structure, you know, architecture, hyperparameters, and so on. Um, it's not just like, I'm going to make a learning algorithm by opening a blank Python interpreter and pressing go. You have to, you have to put stuff in there. You need a learning girl. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, learning is not the same as a human is deliberately teaching me. For example, um, if you, uh, you know, have a, a robot in a sealed box and uh, it is, uh, has an RL algorithm to learn how to control its own body based on internal uh, loss functions, um, that's a perfectly viable learning algorithm. And you could imagine the brain doing something kind of like that. Um, but that's not the kind of like learning that you get in behaviorism. Uh, it's all it's all internal. Um, another thing this is not is plasticity versus non-plasticity. So that means like, for example, synaptic plasticity is when a synapse gets stronger or weaker or forms or dissolves. 
in the brain, um, a syna yeah, synapse is a connection between neurons. Um, so you definitely need plasticity to form a learning algorithm in the brain because, you know, that's, that's how it works. Um, but you also might need plasticity in things that are not learning algorithms. Uh, for example, if you have a, a counter that is sporadically updated and is counting how many times, you know, the mouse has won a fight in its life, uh, there is something like that, I think, in the, in the brainstem um, of the rat. Um, then, you know, the genome would implement that via plasticity, but nobody would call that a learning algorithm. It's not the thing that you do in a machine learning course. It's the thing that you do in other kinds of algorithm courses. It's just a counter. Uh, and then the last thing that this is not is some brilliant idea that I made up that's totally different from machine learning. Uh, for example, you can go to pretty much any GitHub repository in, uh, an archive machine learning paper and, um, probably divide it into learning subsystem and steering subsystem if you really wanted to. For example, uh, in alpha zero, there's presumably some C code that checks whether it's checkmate or not. And presumably uh, in this kind of breakdown, we would say that that's part of the steering subsystem. OK, so um, moving on. Bef before we um, keep going, though, uh, it looks like yes. uh, we've got some questions in the uh, in the chat, um, or at least Nick, Nick has one. Um, so I guess he's asking, um, give a little bit more detail about specifically what you mean uh, when you say brain-like. Um, and I think, I think he, he actually posted this when you were talking about the two subsystems uh, from a couple of slides ago. Um, and he was wondering if that's explicit, like, I guess that makes reference to those explicit, uh, those two subsystems explicitly. Uh, yeah, um, I figured that I was kind of addressing that in the slide. Um, I don't think that two subsystems is uh, uh, a good idea. I think it's it's a useful frame of reference uh, that neuroscientists should use more because um, I think it's just like really obvious when you're writing the code yourself that some things are learning algorithms and other parts of the code are not. Um, but uh, I don't think that that sort of intuition has trickled into neuroscience so much. Um, um, so that's why I sort of spent well, a lot think, of time bringing well, it I, to people. I raised that attention. question partially because I didn't think that you were saying that there were two explicit subsystems. They could be implicitly combined somewhere. It's just, I'm just trying to figure out what, whether or not, you know, some implicit existence of those systems implies that it's brain-like or not. Uh, I'm trying to I think on the definition of brain-like more than, uh, okay. more than trying um, to put you in a box <laughs> in that respect. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, um the uh let's see um the i think the most important uh thing is what i mentioned earlier the question of whether it's model-based reinforcement learning or not um okay the uh uh so yeah i'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later so like one time i wrote a mm -hmm. blog post that was like something about safety and model-based reinforcement learning um well, yeah, I'll, I'll put put that off till later. So when I say brain-like, that allows me to make lots of assumptions um, because then I can say, yeah, because that's how the brain works. Um, and I try not to make assumptions. Understood. Okay, um, thanks. Yeah. Okay. So, ah, oh, here, it was, it was coming. Yeah, so at least from a safety perspective, uh, I think that what the brain is doing, uh, we, sh we should think of it as one version of model-based reinforcement learning. Um, and I don't, I don't think this should be controversial. To me, it seems sort of obvious. Like, there's a model. I can make predictions. If I go to the store, then I can buy a candy bar. Um, and the model is updated by self-supervised learning. Um, if, you know, I didn't expect the ball to bounce, but the ball bounces, then when I see the ball falling towards the floor next time, it won't be unexpected. Uh, and then there's reinforcement learning. If I touch the hot stove, then I burn my finger and I probably won't do it again. Uh, but model-based reinforcement learning is a very big tent um, in the sense that you can probably download any number of archive papers that describe themselves as model-based reinforcement learning, and they'll all be different from each other, and they'll all be different from the brain too. Uh, so the details won't really matter for this talk. Um, you can check out the blog post series for a little bit more discussion. Um, okay, so um, 
Uh, so I, I, I didn't say before why I was using the term steering subsystem. And the, the explanation is that um, I think one especially important task it does, so it does a lot of things. It helps the regulate heart rate and make sure that you keep breathing while you sleep so that you don't die. Um, but one particularly important for our purposes, things that the steering subsystem does is to steer the learning subsystem uh, to emit ecologically useful outputs by sending it rewards. So you touch a hot stove, then the steering subsystem sends negative reward, and then you're less likely to do it again in the future. Um, not only that, but uh, if you think about touching the hot stove, then that thought might be a little aversive if you don't like burning yourself, which most people don't. Um, and this is kind of analogous to how a reinforcement learning reward function steers alpha zero to do certain things. So if you send alpha zero, if you build alpha zero with a reward function that um, rewards winning at chess, then it gets really good at winning at chess. And it tends to make moves that result in winning at chess. And if, if you send it uh, rewards for losing at chess, then that wouldn't happen. Um, so uh, there are um, three types of ingredients that, that uh, one can imagine uh, discovering in our, in our, so we, we get in our time machine and we look at these future AGIs that, that people have built and what, 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 what might we find in the steering subsystems? Uh, so here are three types of ingredients. So the first one is things that the steering subsystem just needs to do in order to get general intelligence. Uh, an example, uh, in all probability, is curiosity drive. Um, I think there's a lot of evidence from the machine learning literature that curi that if you don't have curiosity, then you know, in a sparse reward environment, which is the real world, um, you uh, you know, the agent might not learn things. Um, so obviously, this is a, a factor in humans, uh, and I expect it to be in future AGIs because otherwise they wouldn't be AGIs. That's not to say that it's a good thing. Uh, in fact, curiosity is sort of generically dangerous because we don't want the AGI to choose uh, satisfying its own curiosity over doing things that the humans want it to do or, you know, increasing human flourishing or what, whatever our, our intention with the AGI is. Uh, so then the second category is uh, everything else in the human steering subsystem. Uh, and the prime example here that I'll, that I'll get back to in a little bit is social instincts. Um, which I claim are also related to uh, moral instincts, sort of the idea that, you know, uh, uh, it's good to be nice to your friends and, you know, probably good to be mean to your enemies too. Um, so uh, this is tends to be present in competent humans with some exceptions like high functioning sociopaths. Uh, well, I think, I think high functioning sociopaths do have some social instincts, but I think they have very different social instincts from uh, other people. Um, and we do not expect those by default to show up in future AGIs uh, unless we, first of all, figure out exactly how they work, and second of all, convince uh, whoever is coding those AGIs to actually put them in. Uh, and then third is every other possibility, most of which are wildly different from biology. So, you know, drive to have somebody press the reward button, drive to invent a better solar cell, drive to have stock prices go up, you name it. You know, we're writing the code, or whoever is writing the code can just put in literally anything that they want to put in, uh, assuming that they have some way to turn it into Python code. Uh, so these are obviously not present in humans. Uh, and by default, I would assume that people are going to mess around with lots of different possibilities like that, because that's you know the sort of tradition of what people do in reinforcement learning today. Um, so um, how do these things work? Uh, and in particular, how does the steering subsystem know when to provide reward? So this is the million dollar question that I wish everybody would work on more. Um, and the reason that it's not obvious is that the hypothalamus and the brainstem are basically kind of stupid. They don't understand the world. They don't know what's going on. They don't know uh, about college debt. They don't know about human flourishing and they don't know about space travel. There's a lot of things that they don't know about. They don't know anything that wasn't, you know, Arguably, they don't know anything at all. I think the the world model, our understanding of the world is part of the learning subsystem and not here in the hypothalamus and brainstem. So how are we going to trust the hypothalamus and brainstem to provide ground truth about whether the organism, whether the human is thinking good thoughts and you know doing good things? Um, so one part of the answer 
Uh, not the whole answer, but one part of it is that the steering subsystem, as it turns out, has its own uh, often neglected sensory processing systems. So I actually drew that into this diagram from earlier in the talk, but you might have missed it. I put it with a star here. Um, so uh, when you get inputs from the outside world, they tend to go both to the learning subsystem and to the steering subsystem. Uh, so visual information goes to the visual cortex, but it also goes to the superior colliculus in the brainstem. Uh, taste goes to the gustatory cortex and the insula, um, but it also goes to the medulla in the brainstem. Um, I think smell goes to the hypothalamus and so on and so forth. Uh, so if there's sort of like innate rewards, um, this is one way to implement them. You could have these brainstem or hypothalamus modules that are just looking at the sensory inputs and doing some kind of processing on them. Uh, and they're not very sophisticated, but they are able to apparently do things like detect whether you're looking at a face or not, at least well enough to, to make these systems work. Uh, I think that the superior colliculus can detect faces and snakes and probably is related to fear of heights and things like that. Uh, so that's one part of the answer, but it's not the whole answer because, for example, uh, I don't think your brain can calculate whether or not to feel envious from just running simple heuristics on sensory inputs. Uh, so how do we, so an open problem that I'm especially interested in is how does the steering subsystem build social instincts? Uh, I think empathetic stimulation is involved. Um, mostly, I don't have a great answer here. Uh, I have some sort of vague speculations in post number 13 of the Seri symbol grounding and human social instincts. Um, so just a few more words on this project. Um, why, why do I think this is so important? Um, and I have two answers. Uh, the modest answer is uh, for better understanding. Uh, I, th I would love to get to a place where we have a science that can reach conclusions of the form. You know, you take an AGI with innate drive X and you give it training environment Y and you give it an adult and you wind up with an adult AGI that wants Z. Um, so that's where we want to get. Um, and if we understood human social instincts better, then we would have uh, nice examples that could ground that future science, um, uh, uh, particularly in the very important domains of you know how we think of ourselves and others, and you know more morality and, and things like that. Um, a, a sort of more bold answer is uh, it would be nice to have specific ideas that we could steal, uh, and there's the sort of unsophisticated version of that where we should just slavishly copy human social instincts into an AGI. Mm -hmm. And I don't endorse that. Uh, I think for one thing, AGIs are going to have a different training environment. They're probably not going to grow up with you know human bodies in a human culture. Um, and also, human social instincts leave a lot to be desired for various reasons. Like nobody wants to build AGIs that have teenage angst, or at least nobody should want that. Uh, a much better approach is to understand how human social instincts work. And then maybe uh, adapt some of them to work for AGIs, um, presumably in conjunction with, you know, other non-biological ingredients like interpretability and so on. Um, so that brings me to my conclusion. Um, I think that this is a very big deal when people put these algorithms on computer chips. I mean, probably most of you are already sold on this, but. Um, it's a very big deal, probably the best or worst thing that will ever happen to humanity, certainly the weirdest. Um, and there's technical work that we can do today. Um, and thank you for listening. Uh, right. I guess I'll just jump jump right into questions. Yep. I noticed there's a few in the chat. Looks like it. OK. Um, so uh, what should? everyone call you says um what kinds of images would cause a human's learned dog detector circuitry to maximally act activate uh yeah I, I don't have any opinion on that um uh, uh I, yeah i don't think that's particularly a uh very safety relevant uh i don't think about it too much and i don't have much opinion um, it, I, I'd be curious, um, uh, when, when we figure out everything about the brain, that does sound like a fun question that I'd be interested in the question, in the answer to, um, 
uh, what should everyone call you asks, uh, what's your model of how empathetic modeling works in humans? Uh, I think I'm just going to pass on that one and say you should read post number 13 of, of my series. Uh, I think that, well, okay, I'll give a, a very short answer, which is that, um, so for example, uh, if you see a chair, then it tends to activate your, you know, latent world model neurons involved in the concept of chair, sort of un unintentionally and without any thought and automatically and extremely quickly. Um, I think by the same token, if you see, uh, you have some things in your world model that are related to me getting punched in the stomach. And I think that um, if somebody else, if I see somebody else getting punched in the stomach, then uh, there's probably going to be some overlap of those learned models in the latent space. And um, uh, that's going to also activate the sort of same cringe things that the me getting punched in the stomach activates. Uh, I'm not sure that was a great answer, but uh, that's the best that uh, I want to do without, you know, spending the next 20 minutes on it. Uh, okay. Uh, next is Nick. Uh, what kinds of technical work can we do today? Um, what are some proximal or medium term goals? Uh, so obviously I have the thing that I'm working on, which is to unravel what the heck, if anything, is happening in the hypothalamus and brainstem that leads mechanistically one step after another into humans having the full range of social instincts from saddest drive to envy, assuming, I mean, there's some controversy over exactly what is innate versus what is learned. Um, and that's sort of part of the question that I'm interested in. Uh, so I'm working on that uh, much of the time. And uh, if you look at the last post of my series, uh, I have, that. that's one of seven open problems that uh, I'd be delighted for people to spend time working on. Um, and I'm not going to go through the other ones here. You can just read that post. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, Solar Fire has a question. How common do you think sociopathy or psychopathy, by the way, I don't know how those differ. Uh, I'm not sure that they really do. I feel like I've read a lot of different explanations of the difference between sociopaths and psychopaths, and they're all inconsistent. So I mostly just sort of round those two, two terms to the same thing. If somebody is an expert, I'd be interested for you to politely teach me what, what the actual difference is. But let's just uh, say either of them. How common are those in non-humans, and what does that imply? I have no idea. Um, I have never heard of psychopathic rats. For all I know, they exist. Uh, and if anybody has seen any papers about them, you should email them to me. My email is stephen.burns at gmail.com. Oh, I have it here. Um, so I'm, um, so you can either put more questions in the chat or else jump in on, on voice. Uh, so I've got a question. Um, what kind of, like, if you had the, uh, like the opportunity to, I guess, like have some engineers develop some infrastructure of some kind, maybe, you know, some tools or something like that, um, to help with this research agenda. Do you have any idea what that would look like? Is that, is that something you've kind of put some thought into? Um, yeah, uh, the, the answer is, uh, I can't think of anything, uh, but I also haven't put much thought into it. Um, there's a group called Project Antelope, A-I-N-T-E-L-O-P-E -E or something that, uh, led by Gunnar Zarnke, um, that is doing some sort of, I, I don't know the, the details and I'm probably going to describe this poorly, but I sort of understand that they're doing some kind of like grid world, something or other that's supposedly related to social instincts. Um, uh, I don't understand exactly um, what they're trying to do uh, or what's going to come out of it. Um, but I'm, they've thought about it a lot and maybe they have some great idea. I don't have much opinion either way. Um, 
I am mostly reading neuroscience papers and coming up with extremely simple toy models that are so simple that I don't really need to do anything other than like write down the pseudocode and say, obviously this is wrong because it, you know, predicts the wrong things in XYZ. I guess I need different pseudocode. Um, when, once I have something that's uh, even remotely plausible, then uh, I would be presumably spending more time thinking about how to test it more carefully. I see. Thank you. Don't mind me asking a question, which is a bit unrelated, but um, Steve, I had to ask you about your recent post on schizophrenia, if you don't mind. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, anything in particular? Yeah. So it's it pretty strongly contradicts my pet theory, and I was just wondering your thoughts on that. So it seems that one of the things. So for people who don't know, Steve recently wrote a great post um, about his, you know. He says low confidence theory about what schizophrenia might be. He thinks it might be related to a lessening of long range connections in the brain. And I think there's a lot of cool evidence he puts in his post for that. But um, I can't help but notice that it seems to contradict the most common theory of schizophrenia, which is that it's a saliency disorder. Um, so what you see sometimes in schizophrenic people is that they spontaneously hyper focus on like specific things and become like unable to shift attention away from them. And they like, they'll like hyper focus on like sounds or voices or concepts or so on. And it seems to me that that is kind of like more of a straddle kind of thing. Or it's like my pet theory is that schizophrenia is higher noise levels on the in single neuron level, which leads to micro seizures. And I would be interesting if you think that your theory just explains like these like saliency problems as well, because it feels like post um, didn't address that. Yeah, just to be crystal clear, um, mm -hmm. I th think I've spent uh, f f four work days of my life uh, trying to understand schizophrenia. Fair enough. One of them was uh -huh. writing that post. Uh, one of them was last summer when I came up with the theory. One of them was writing a different post on whether schizophrenia is related to blindness or not. Um, and I decided that it wasn't. Uh, and then I think a few years earlier, I had spent the day and not gotten anywhere. Uh, so I am like extremely, extremely not even close to knowing the symptoms of schizophrenia, let alone the body of theory. Uh, it just seemed like I have this sort of rule of thumb that if I can write a decent blog post in four hours, I should just do it. Um, so that was one of those. Uh, I, if you send email me resources on that saliency thing, um, I don't have anything that pops into my head that is like uh, intelligent on the topic. Um, so uh, I will, either, yeah, you should email me or else I'll try to remember to think about it at some point. Oh, um, no. I got good. I got good feedback in the comment section, and that was really all I was hoping for. Cool. All right. Thanks. If I can ask a second question, which is more on topic, assuming I wanted to do this research myself, like I want to be the next Steve Burns, how would you recommend I like get started? Um. Uh, uh, yeah. So my my research method is that um, I try to understand how the brain works, uh, and then read neuroscience papers, and then I'm surprised that they uh, go against my prior expectations, and then I make my model better uh, and iterate, iterate for the last couple of years. Um, and hopefully my model has been getting progressively uh, less incorrect over time. Um, I am happy to talk to people about like very specific things that I'm confused about in terms of um, what's going on in the brain right now. And like, uh, I don't have any great answer uh, to that question, I guess. Uh, yeah, re reach out and chit chat. I'm happy to chit chat with people. Could you give us um, any examples of like how you've had to change a model or anything like that? Or, you know, just even some iterations would be Kind of cool to get some concrete grasp on like what kind of thoughts you're having uh yeah so i think it was like two weeks ago maybe a month ago uh, i went back through um 
the intro to brain like AGI safety blog posts and made some changes. Uh, I deleted one whole section that seemed importantly wrong. Um, uh, let's see. They're all, um, uh, I, I have a change log written down somewhere. Uh, you can cool. message me and I can like walk you through it if you're interested. That sounds great. Here's a silly question. <clears throat> On the schizophrenia one, which of the percentages is the actual correct one for the like circle type thing? Um, I tried uh, screenshotting it and like clipping it in PowerPoint, and I think it's forty percent. Ah, good. I was right. Woo! Yeah, nice. <laughs> Maybe you have schizophrenia. I guess I shouldn't cheer about that. <laughs> I guess as another, uh, a little bit of a tangent question, um, there was recently a post on Less Wrong uh, where Eliza or Eliezer uh, was talking, I believe, with Scott. Um, and I believe you had some disagreements uh, with him about um uh i i guess the model uh that that he had um in terms of like hard coded uh i guess like hard coded um i can't actually remember the exact details um do you want to give some comments on that uh yeah um i also uh sort of wrote a better version i i put a comment on the post and then elaborated it on on it with a post called heritability and behaviorism and model-based reinforcement learning uh, a few days ago um, on Less Wrong. Um, somebody can send the link to that into the chat, I guess. Um, the uh, Let's see. So there is a sort of school of thought kind of associated with, um, famously, Steven Pinker advocates for it a lot. Um, and it dates back to Cosmides and Tubi, I think. Um, called evolved modularity um and sort of yeah there's like it's popular in evolutionary psychology and cognitive science to say that uh there are a lot of things that um i would point out as okay so for example um if i'm not going to describe this well because i don't really understand the perspective um but um so for example let's see so we hu humans have a intuitive sense of physics for example and um uh i want to ex and sort of everybody's explanations of pe people's intuitions tend to point the same direction even when that direction is not like veridically describing reality for example a lot of people will make the same mistakes in intro physics courses because there are the same things are unintuitive to everybody. So when I look at data like that, I would say something about, uh, well, everybody has similar learning algorithms and everybody has similar training data, namely, you know, playing with blocks as kids and, and all that stuff. And therefore everybody winds up with sort of similar learned models at the end. Uh, and that's the explanation for intuitive physics, you know, being similar across cultures and so on. Um, the sort of Pinker, Cosmides, 2B type explanation for the same thing would be to say that intuitive physics is somehow in the genome and the genome builds this module into the brain that is called intuitive physics. Uh, and that's especially relevant when we get to uh, things like human social instincts um, and things like uh, envy and, uh, you know, status drive and things like that. Um, so my theory is that um, so the, so I, I think that it's possible to explain those things in turn in model based reinforcement learning terms, and that's this whole research project about social instincts. Uh, but I don't actually know the explanation um, right now, uh, to my own satisfaction. And I have sort of enough vague ideas that I feel like an explanation should exist. But there's like a really big symbol grounding problem um, that I talk about again in post number thirteen. And um, 
I could imagine a world where the correct answer is just like, it doesn't work. There is no way to solve the symbol grounding problem. And that's, you're, you're, you just started out going the wrong direction. And really, you know, there's a thing in the brain that's like, this is a person who I like, who has high status. And it's not just this sort of generic kind of learning algorithm. There's something like very specific with like people and different people can slot into the different individual slots. And um, then like you can do some analysis on, you know, the different people and the different people slots in your, in your brain and figure out who has high status or not. And then that can all be sort of hard coded in a very specific and straightforward way. Um, and I think my impression is that uh, Eliezer, Yukaski and Nate Soares uh, subscribe to something like that. Uh, they think that um, the brain has, uh, you know, uh, pe people analysis code that's a lot more specific than I think it is. Um, and yeah, it, until I have a complete explanation of human social instincts in the framework that I think is right, uh, then I can hardly blame people for thinking that the, the right explanation is something different. Um, but that's basically, I don't know if that helps. Uh, you can ask follow-up questions. I see. I don't have to, I don't have a super clear, uh, you know, super, super detailed, uh, model, but, um, I, I think that more or less kind of answers, um, at least it gives me a clearer picture of, of, of what's going on. Okay. Uh, maybe I'll do the one in the chat next. Sure. Uh, so, uh, what should everyone call you asks, can you give one example of an alignment agenda you think can't work, uh, and your cruxes for why not? Um, I think um, uh, most of my uh, most of my disagreements with uh, people pursuing different agendas uh, arise at the like threat model step and not at the solution step. I think that um, we should be uh, worried about and thinking about. Uh, in AGI that is some kind of model-based reinforcement learning and that is, uh, um, you know, quote unquote, trying to do things uh, in a relatively straightforward and human-like sense. Um, and uh, so then, and that is like, yeah, sort of trained in a way that's somewhat analogous to how a human learns during their lifetime. Uh, so there's a lot of research agendas that don't address that. Um, like if you look at the risks from learned optimization paper by Evan Hubinger and a bunch of other people, um, if you look at Vanessa Kosoy's research agenda, which is something a little bit more, uh, well, I, I have a whole post on that. Um, if you look at, uh, yeah, debate and eliciting learned knowledge and all these things about conditioning language models, um, uh, all of those are not really addressing that threat model. Um, I th think that those are, yeah, so I don't like, have some dogma. I think that we should be, uh, again, my polite diplomatic thing to say is that we should be addressing lots of different threat models and yeah, kumbaya, live and let live. Um, uh, I, yeah, um, that, that's probably the short version of my answer. All right. Does anyone else have any other questions? Oh, it looks like uh, what should everyone call you has got something else to follow up. <laughs> I guess not. All right. Um, okay, I guess we'll give it maybe a, a second or two if, if somebody else has something they want to say. Um, but uh, I guess otherwise, uh, thank you very much for your time uh, and for putting this together. Um, yeah. Uh, this is, yeah. <laughs> um, I should probably work on uh, uh, my, my, my host speech uh, leading in. No worries. But, uh, uh, 
Uh, I also want to reiterate that I'm happy to talk more to anybody. Uh, you can DM me here. Uh, you can also uh, email me again, stephen.burns at gmail.com. Yeah, thanks so much, Steve. Uh, as someone who has uh, emailed and DM Steve before, I can recommend it. Uh, Steve is doing really, really great work. If you read any of his stuff, if you have a bunch of time, his intro to brain like AGI safety is like one of my favorite thing written on less wrong last year. So highly recommend it. It's really interesting work and I think under under appreciated. So thanks so much, Steve. Thanks for really inviting me. You coming. Thanks, Steve. Really appreciate it. All right. Thanks, Steve. Cool. All right. I think we can uh, I think we can call it here then. Uh, thanks for coming, everybody. Uh, and, um, yeah, uh, we'll try, we'll see if the recording actually worked. Um, but we'll, we'll see what we can do to make this, uh, this talk available, um, afterwards. I have a meta question about, about the series. How did this come about? And do you have any expectation for what a schedule's like or anything like that? If not, that's fine. I just figured this is a good chance to ask. Yeah, sure. So I decided to do it is how it came about. Um, nice. I was, I was just, it was just like, oh, we should do this. Um, and uh, in terms of like scheduling, I, I'm i thinking either two, like once every two or once every three weeks, um, depending on kind of how much material I can uh, and how many speakers I can actually line up. Um, but yeah, that's sort of like the uh, regularity and... I think another thing is that I want it to stay uh, pretty technical. Um, so I know there's a lot of like uh, sort of like introductory um, talks, uh, but I think I think maybe uh, you know well you know we can we can have a mix of those and then also like really you know kind of get into the weeds uh, kind of stuff. Um, and that's 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 why I'm looking to to get in the long run out of out of these uh, out of these talks, really getting into more technical alignment research. Got it. Cool. Thanks. All right. I will kill the recording now.